and thanks a lot for joining us. Great, thanks very much for having me. Um, so to get started, this, uh, this talk is about one of the ways that, that we can use graphs to benefit a wide range of AI and, and machine learning applications. And so one of the key bottlenecks in developing new applications in these areas is the need for supervision. And usually that comes in the form of hand labeled examples, which can be expensive or time consuming to, to collect. So what I'll talk about today is how graphs can help us learn with fewer labels, particularly when new tasks are semantically related to the ones we already know how to do. So our primary goal here is to drive down the marginal cost of new models by replacing hand-labeled examples with graphs that describe new tasks and how they're related to the tasks that we already know how to do. So broadly, this type of machine learning is called zero-shot learning. And in the first part of, of the talk, I'll give you uh, a rundown of this area um, because I think it's really exciting and, and could use more, more people um, thinking about it and paying attention to it. Um, so I wanna just kind of introduce that broadly in case you haven't seen that before. And then the reason that I'm particularly excited to talk to, to this audience, to, to this group of people, um, is because graphs are, um, I think, a really powerful but underexplored tool for zero-shot learning. And um, they, because they capture a lot of information about the world in a way that can, we can exploit potentially. Um, so there's a few great uh, existing works that have started to explore this idea. Primarily, they've been in the computer vision community and focused on object classification using the ImageNet graph. So what I'll get to um, towards the, the second half later in the talk is um, what we're doing in, in our group to try to expand this paradigm to, to more tasks, a wider range of tasks and a wider range of, of domains and just more generally improve graph-based zero-shot learning um, to make it a, a more general purpose tool. Um, so what we'll get to is um, some of the contributions that I'll talk about later are that um, we propose a couple of things. The first new idea um, that, that I want you to take away from this talk is that we can embed nodes in common sense knowledge graphs uh, to create representations for concepts that let us predict novel classes, unseen concepts in both natural language processing and computer vision tasks. Um, and another thing uh, on the modeling side that, that I wanna share with you is how we can increase the expressivity of graph neural networks um, with a, a new type of architecture where, where we actually use uh, small transformers to aggregate the information in node neighborhoods. And what I'll show you is that this checks a couple of boxes that have been um, difficult to bring together in graph neural network architectures in that um, we're gonna be aggregating neighborhoods in a nonlinear way, which is nice because it gives us more expressivity, um, but it's also gonna be permutation invariant, meaning that it's invariant to the um, order of the, the nodes in the neighborhood that we, that we feed into the, the network. And so then what I'll end with are some results showing how um, these ideas can lead to significant gains in graph-based zero-shot learning, um, including uh, some on, on, on a couple of data sets where we are, this, that this new approach is actually able to um, set new state-of-the-art accuracies um, versus not just graph-based methods, but even specialized methods that have been developed within either the language or vision communities for specific tasks. So to get started, let's talk about the problem of zero-shot learning and, and why I think it's really quite interesting. Um, it's a little bit of a strange name. Uh, we're kind of stuck with it as a community now. But uh, the, the, the idea is that what we want to do is predict um, uh, examples of target classes without ever having seen any examples of those classes. And it sounds kind of strange, like how, how could we even hope to do such a thing? Well, the key idea is that we're going to learn how to map descriptions of classes to examples of those classes using some labeled data. So we're gonna start with some tasks where we know how, where we have supervision and we kind of know how to solve the problem. 
Um, so for example, we might have some scene classes like mouse and zebra and lion. But then what we're gonna wanna do is plug in new descriptions of classes that we haven't seen before, maybe like sheep and walrus and bat, and be able to identify instances of these classes, even if we've never seen them before. Um, so this is uh, an area of machine learning that's been studied um, mostly for the, the, the last um, 10 or 12 years or so. A lot of the foundational work was done in, in the late 2000s. Um, Chang et al, Lampert et al are some of the, the, the foundational papers. Um, since then, like a lot of things, uh, deep learning has taken over. And so a lot of work on zero shot learning uh, looks something like this architecture here. And so for the purposes of today, we can think about what we're trying to do in terms of, of this architecture here. And so what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna classify um, examples. And so we do that with these two components uh, to our architecture. We have uh, two different modules. So on your left, we have the input encoder. And this is the neural network that maps the examples to um, a vector representation, a dense, a dense feature representation. And so this looks just like supervised learning. If you're doing images, perhaps you use a convolutional neural network. If you're doing text, perhaps you use an LSTM or a transformer or something like that. And so um, this, is, this looks pretty standard. The, the really interesting thing about zero-shot learning in, in this architecture is the right-hand side, the class encoder. Now what we're going to do is we're going to feed in human written or human, human interpretable descriptions of classes. And what we're going to want to do is learn how to map them to vectors that align with examples of those classes. So each one of these modules, the input and the class encoders, produce vectors and then we'll, we'll take the dot product of them and we want that dot product to be high when the class matches the input. So let's look at an example. So um, one of the first data sets in zero shot learning uh, was animals with attributes, which uh, is exactly as it sounds. We wanna classify different animals and we're using as our class descriptions um, a, a predefined set of, of attributes and it's kind of like a logical description because we have um, a binary vector and so uh, that, that is true or false depending on whether that animal typically has that. So like a mouse we have it, it's that it's small and furry but not aquatic and doesn't have stripes. Um, and so for now um, because we have this, this, our description is just a binary vector, um, we can keep our, uh, our class encoder pretty simple. Um, we could probably just use a fully connected layer, maybe with some, some nonlinearities um, somewhere in it, maybe, maybe a, a, a two fully connected layers with, with a nonlinearity. And so what we want to do now is when we feed in the mouse and the description of the mouse, get a high score, maybe, maybe seven, let's say. Um, and then when we change the class description, but don't change the image, ideally the score will be low. So now if I go to a description of a lion, okay, maybe it's also furry, but it's not small anymore. What we hope is that our score will go down. And if I change this further to something that, you know, now is furry and has stripes like a zebra, this score will, will go down further still perhaps. So what we wanna do is we want to learn uh, these modules to, to produce this behavior. And the way that we do that is, um, is by taking advantage of the fact that we have seen classes, that we start out with some labeled data for a specific set of classes. Um, and so maybe an animal's with attributes would be mouse, lion, and zebra. So what we can do is we can take these scores and um, feed them into a cross entropy loss. And we have the, the we, we know the label for these training examples. So I can compute the loss and back propagate and update both the example encoder and the class encoder. So in that sense, it will be similar to what we do at supervised, uh, with supervised learning in that we're, we're trying to minimize the loss on our training data using this, using this label training data. But the, the key difference that I think is really interesting and makes this a really powerful and, and general approach is that rather that, that we're, we're generalizing what we typically do in supervised learning. We're now doing something more general. Usually we learn class weights as vectors for each one of the classes when we're, when we're learning. 
But now in this setup, we're not going to learn any class specific parameters. There's no weight vector that we just, that we just sort of uh, learn specifically for a class. We instead learn this encoder. And so now what that lets us do is I can potentially change or, or even replace or expand the set of classes that I consider at test time. So now I can plug in descriptions for things that I've never seen before. And if I do a good job of this, of this learning, then ideally um, I'll be able to, to classify these things just based on their similarities with things that, I've already, that I already know about, um, if I learn, the, if I learn these, these networks correctly. So that's a, a, a relatively simple example of zero-shot learning. Uh, naturally, a lot of the work on zero-shot learning since, since, since the early work has focused on the class encoder. How do, how do we, what, what should we use for the, for the description in the class encoder? And there's interesting trade-offs here because uh, the descriptions can vary in terms of how easy they are for humans to produce. Um, and also how much explicit information they, they make available or how much discriminative information they make available for the actual task. Um, so this is a quick rundown of some of the broad categories um, that people have considered. People have considered kind of logical attributes like you saw and also more, more complicated rules. Um, one thing that's pretty natural to do is word embedding. So if, if I have say a glove vector for the word sheep, I could use that as my representation for the class. Uh, people have also considered either user written or, or Wikipedia descriptions of, of classes, so natural language, uh, using natural language to specify classes. And a little more recently, um, there's been uh, th this new idea, um, Lang et al. in CVPR 2018 and then Kempfmeyer et al. in, in CVPR 2019 um, proposed that we could use ImageNet or subgraphs of ImageNet as the descriptions for classes. And so this is another category of, of class descriptions. Um, and that's what we're gonna, we're gonna focus on. So for, uh, for, for using knowledge graphs as class descriptions, we might get to set up something um, like this example, this picture here. So this is a, this is a subset of ImageNet. Um, and so if we want to describe a mouse, uh, what we see is that if we look at th this subset of the two hop neighborhood, we, we can see that a mouse is a rodent, which is a type of animal, and there's, there's subtypes of, of mouse as well. And so th this idea is really interesting because uh, using graphs to represent classes has several um, benefits that it, it, first of all, it's easy to take advantage of the large knowledge graphs that are already out there, already sitting out there um, with lots of information. And um, further, graphs are in this really nice space, at, at this really nice point in the trade-off space um, between uh, flexibility and rigidity. So um, the graphs can make explicit the kind of the key features that distinguish classes. You can, you can use the nodes and edges to kind of call out the most important things, but they're still more flexible than the, the attribute-based methods where you have to specify ahead of time, what is the, what is the space of attributes that you're even going to, to consider um, before, before you start learning? And so this, this flexibility, uh, this combination of flexibility, but also kind of explicit high-level knowledge is, is one of the main reasons why this approach to zero shot learning is so exciting. So, um, and a lot of this is made possible by, by graph neural networks, the, the recent innovations in, in graph neural networks. Um, and um, the reason is that, is that they let us map uh, graphs or subgraphs to, vector, uh, to a vector space without um, uh, maybe needing to, to specify ahead of time exactly what the structure of that graph is. I can, I can pass in different graph substructure, subgraphs with different numbers of nodes and different numbers of edges and things like that. So that's, that's, um, that ability is really what's made, uh, made this possible. So we'll look a little bit more at, at how that works um, 
And, but at a high level, what, what we're doing is, is this now, we're plugging in a particular type of, of description for our classes. And so now what I want to do is I want to aggregate information um, uh, uh, on, um, uh, on this network and use it to embed um, the, uh, the, the central node mouse and have that be aligned with the input space so that when I actually see a picture of a mouse, the, um, the score uh, between the, the, when you multiply those two vectors is high. So we'll talk a little bit about graph neural networks. Um, I, I actually, so the, uh, Will Hamilton who's speaking right after me is, is uh, gonna do, a, I think a much more authoritative and comprehensive view of things. Um, so uh, I, won't, I won't try to cover everything here, but um, as a quick crash course, uh, what we're doing is um, we are, uh, starting out by passing messages on the graph structure in order to compute uh, a new embedding for the central node. So in this case, the central node is mouse. And what we're gonna do is initialize all of the, um, uh, each node with some initial feature vector. And so um, in zero shot learning, that usually is like a glove embedding or, or some other word embedding for the, the word that defines that node. So I'd have the word for mammal and for something like house mouse, maybe I, I'd average those two um, embeddings together if, if the bigram house mouse wasn't, wasn't actually in my vocabulary. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass messages along the graph from the outermost nodes um, into the, the central node. And so at first we'll go, um, We'll pass, uh, informate, we'll pass that feature vector from mammal uh, to rodent. And then um, we'll pass, uh, we'll compute a new representation for rodent and then pass that this, um, everything in the neighborhood around the central node in again to, to compute our final representation. And so the key thing that's happening here is at each node, um, there's kind of two stages, this aggregate and, and combine uh, steps that we have to do to, to combine this information. And this view of graph neural networks as being, uh, being able to fit all the different work into these aggregating and combining steps, that's something that um, uh, Will introduced. Uh, so we'll adopt that, that, that framework because it's really useful to think about what the methods are doing. So at each point when we're passing those messages from a neighbor to the central node, this is what we want to do. The first thing is we have this aggregate function. And so that's like a, it's a many to one function. So we want to take um, the, uh, the, the, all the neighbors um, as well as the node itself. So rodent, house, mouse, et cetera, and collect that into a, a central representation um, uh, for the neighborhood. And so you can, for now, you can just think of this aggregate function as an average. We, something simple we could do is just average over all of the, um, the, the neighbors. And then something that sometimes is useful to do is to combine back in the central node to kind of emphasize that it's really the, the important one. And so maybe you'll, you'll either um, multiply the central node by a weight matrix and add it in, or maybe you'll concatenate it. We won't worry about that too much. Um, the, the point is that we have this many to one function where we're taking all the neighbors and producing um, what's noted here as mouse prime, some, some updated vector um, for, for this node based on its neighborhood. Okay. And so that's a, that's a, a quick general view of, of graph neural networks. And so now uh, what I'll do is, is tell you about how people have used these for zero shot learning. Um, and there, there's a couple of, of um, kind of primary related works um, that I wanna focus on. Uh, the first one is um, SGCN, uh, which, which stands for single graph convolutional network. Um, and so it's a, an, an inductive graph convolutional network applied to the ImageNet graph. So inductive in this case um, uh, is that um, it, we can, that what that refers to is the fact that we can potentially change or expand the graph after training. Uh, the graph after training, that's gonna be really important for zero shot learning because we might have totally new classes that we wanna specify. 
Um, a bit of a historical note, um, the year before this was originally proposed as GCNZ um, by Wang et al. Um, and that was a transductive um, uh, uh, method that assumed access to the entire graph at training test time. Um, so this, this slightly modified version came out uh, a year later, but it's essentially the same idea that we're gonna just run um, uh, sort of your standard graph convolutional networks. We'll, aver we'll use averages to, to aggregate over our neighborhoods and we'll run that on the ImageNet graph in order to comp compute class representations. And then um, a year later, the second method that we'll consider is uh, dense graph propagation. And this, this was Ken Meyer's um, contribution in 2019. And what, what they noticed was that uh, because the ImageNet graph has a hierarchy, um, it might be beneficial to adapt the architecture and um, uh, more explicitly capture that, that hierarchical information. And um, in particular, allow information to be passed directly from higher levels in hierarchy down to the central node. Uh, and so essentially what they do is that they add some skip connections and pass messages in two steps. So first, they collect all the, all the messages from um, the two hop uh, uh, set of ancestors. So now mammal can pass directly information, information directly to mouse, which is something that wasn't happening before. And once that's been done, it gets combined with um, all the information that gets passed from uh, the descendants. And uh, it's not shown on, on this example because it's too small, but we would also do this over um, potentially a couple hops. So we would, we would get messages directly from um, the, the grandchildren, not just, not just the children. So these were the, the kind of the, the first ideas in um, mapping nodes directly to class representation for zero shot learning. Um, and so we got really interested in this work because it's like I said, it, there's something really just kind of conceptually appealing about using graphs. Um, but what we started to wonder was, well, what if we wanted to apply this to tasks beyond object classification, um, which, which was essentially what one of the main things that ImageNet was, was created for. Um, and uh, it, that choice is potentially limiting in several ways that, that might limit our ability to generalize to new tasks, perhaps in natural language processing, um, for, for the following reasons. Um, first of all, ImageNet is, is focused on um, concrete nouns or, or classes of nouns. So um, there's uh, uh, all of the all of the all of the nodes refer to 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 types of of objects. Um, we don't have anything like adjectives to tell us what you know what color is a mouse. Is it furry? Is it is it does it have a tail? Things like that. Um, and it's also restricted to the uh, generally the the and is a hierarchy. So the edges that we have to use for learning our representations are these are these is a relationships where each thing is a is a subset of of its parents. Um, and finally, there's no there's no freeform nodes. Um, and so if we just wanted to know something like uh, uh, some useful information, like perhaps um, something that would be in a more general graph, is that a mouse is kind of like a bat without wings, something that might be hard to fit into a formal schema, but you could express in a phrase. Um, that's also something that, that we um, lack if we restrict ourselves to ImageNet. So to try to um, expand the, the generality of these methods, that led us to explore um, what we call uh, zero shot learning with common sense. And our, our first proposal was to um, use a richer, more complex graph, um, particularly a common sense knowledge graph as the, the source of class descriptions for our tasks. Um, and in particular, we, uh, you know, to make a choice, we focused on, on ConceptNet, um, which, is, which is a nice graph. Um, and so I'll tell you about that um, for a minute, and then we'll also talk about um, some of the interesting issues that come up in um, the graph neural networks that we use to learn these representations. And I'll tell you about how we can use um, transformers to, uh, or a transformer-based architecture to better exploit some of this, some of this additional rich information that we're getting by moving to a common sense um, uh, knowledge graph. 
So um, common sense knowledge graphs have been around for a while um, and, and ConceptNet isn't the only one. There's Atomic and FrameNet to, to, to name a couple of others. Um, and so this example here shows you some of the additional stuff that we're missing out on if we restrict ourselves to ImageNet. Sure, we know that mouse is a rodent still, but we're, we're missing things like um, places where we might find a mouse, like in a garden and other things that define a garden by also being there, perhaps plants and terraces and bugs. Um, and so we can follow these associations um, to, to learn much more about a class uh, than would be made explicit in, in the ImageNet graph. Um, and we also have uh, another nice thing about consummate is we kind of have these generic related to edges. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, there, people see similarities between mice and bats, and that's something that is, is made explicit. Um, what's not shown here, though, is that the price we pay for this expressivity is, is noise. That if you um, go into conceptnet, it can be difficult to disambiguate. Well, do you mean the rodent or do you mean the, the computer mouse? And so you might have some, some spurious edges as well um, in, in your graph, and that's something that um, we'll have to deal with. So this, this richer information leads us to um, a technical question. Um, dense graph propagation showed us that richer models can be beneficial, that, that by um, changing our architecture to account for um, uh, some of the, the, the structure of the graph, um, we can potentially do better uh, in terms of zero-shot learning. Um, but now we can't apply that strategy anymore because we don't have a hierarchy anymore. We don't have um, this directed acyclic graph that, that allow us to define these, um, these, these two stages of propagation. And so that led us to, to ask the question, how can we better represent um, this rich information? How can we uh, create neural networks that, that kind of can better, can better integrate all of this stuff um, and it, this potentially noisy stuff that we have for, um, for our class descriptions. And so to answer that question, um, we turn back to uh, the, the basic notion of, of, of how graph neural networks are defined um, and look at these, uh, particularly at this aggregate function that is used to define um, most graph neural networks. And so most, I'd say a, the large majority of work on graph neural networks um, has focused on linear aggregators. And so that could be something as straightforward as um, just taking the mean or the element wise maximum of all the neighbors. And so that's what some of the, the, the first work in graph convolutional networks and, and um, uh, GraphSage, which is Will Hansen's work did. Um, and then even more um, sort of uh, more sophisticated methods like, like graph attention networks and relational graph networks, um, they take weighted averages of the neighbors. Um, and so that those weights that you use might be computed using attention or in the case of relational graph networks might be determined by the type of edge that connects the neighbor to the central node. But at the end of the day, these are all still linear because that neighborhood vector that you get out um, of this many to one function is still a linear combination of the neighbors that got passed in. Um, and so th this has been something that's been um, kind of an open question in, in graph neural networks and, and particularly graph convolutional networks, um, which is, can we get nonlinearity into these aggregators um, so that we could learn maybe more interesting combinations of our uh, neighborhoods? So, um, uh, uh, Will, again, who's going to be speaking next, um, proposed, well, maybe we could use LSTMs for this. And so the idea would be that we would treat each neighbor in our, um, in, in, our, in, our, in our neighborhood as like a word in a sentence, and we would pass them into an LSTM one cell at a time, and then we'd get some final representation out for our neighborhood. Um, and, and it's been shown that sometimes this, this can be beneficial and definitely um, increase the expressivity of your, of your neural networks. The challenge is that 
what we've done is impose an arbitrary ordering on our nodes. There's no reason that rodent should come first or, or has to come first and then it, you know, go in this particular order like rodent, rat, garden, mouse. Um, and so a potential um, challenge with using LSTMs is that this arbitrary ordering um, can, can lead to, to instability. And so um, just to illustrate this in, in the sense that we might actually get um, significantly different representations just by randomly shuffling the order of the nodes. Um, so, so one little um, illustration of this that we did, um, we took the animals with attributes to data set um, and so we trained, we trained an LSTM um, graph neural network to, uh, to, to, for, for zero-shot learning, and we, we trained it to try to be permutation invariant by shuffling it, shuffling the nodes that were fed in um, at each training, uh, at each, in each training batch. So, so hopefully it would learn that um, it should not be sensitive to that ordering. Um, but even after doing that, we found that um, over 10 different shuffles, 17% uh, of the predictions that we made on images. So, so once we had passed all the information through the network and used it to predict the label for an image in a zero shot setting, 17% of those um, examples had inconsistent labels over 10 um, shuffles. And you can kind of see the breakdown here. Um, so 83% so, so had 10 out of 10 the same, but then um, uh, additional examples um, had uh, some inconsistencies and even some were, were kind of split 50-50 between two different classes. And so um, this kind of illustrates maybe one of the, the potential problems of, of learning with LSTMs. And what we found was, and I'll show you in a minute, that, that this can potentially, this seems to impact um, the quality of, of the class representations that we learned. So we decided to try to address this problem um, by proposing um, using, using transformer-based aggregators to learn um, in this setting. And, and we hypothesized that this would be useful because there would be enough rich information in the graph that, that kind of learning this more complicated aggregation function would, would be worthwhile. Um, and so to be clear, these are, these are small transformers. They're not, they're not big like, like BERT, they're, 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 they're much smaller in terms of parameters. Um, but uh, what we do have now is that each one of our nodes gets passed through a couple fully connected layers. Then we use um, querying and self-attention to compute updated representations for all those nodes. And then finally, the last thing we do is only at that point do we average the nodes together to come up with, a, with a, an overall representation for our neighborhood. And so what's nice about this is it kind of checks both boxes. We have now an aggregator that is nonlinear like LSTMs, but permutation invariant like the linear aggregators. Um, and so uh, that's um, something that, that kind of makes uh, our, uh, this potentially um, uh, a useful addition to the graph neural network toolbox. Um, and so we call this architecture uh, uh, transformer uh, GCNs. So what I want to do now is kind of show you the, the, the impact of, of um, these tools and uh, look at some examples on a few uh, uh, zero-shot learning tasks. So the first one um, is a couple of image classification tasks. Uh, and so we have um, uh, animals with attributes, which I told you about, and then also another data set called APY that is similar, but just has a wider range of classes. So in addition to animals, we have things like um, motorcycles and plants and other stuff like that. Um, and so what, what I'll show you is um, the comparison against um, some of the state of the art, uh, uh, at least up till the end of 2020, uh, state of the art um, zero shot methods. Uh, that are specifically designed in the vision community for these problems and they, and they rely on an attribute schema to, to describe both the seen and unseen classes. Um, and then I'll also show you the results um, for the graph-based methods. So we'll start off with, with the specialized methods. So these are methods that, that are specifically tied to um, using the attributes that, that they're assuming are available that capture things like 
you know, is what color is this object likely to be? What is it? What types of body parts does this animal have? Stuff like that. Um, so you can see that animals with attributes were ranging between 60 and 80 percent, uh, roughly. And then APY, there's a bit of a drop off because um, I, I, we, we believe because there's just a wider range of classes. And we see this also with the kind of the existing, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the existing um, graph-based methods as well, that on AWA, they're, they're uh, animals with attributes, they're, they're basically um, at the same level of performance, but that there's a significant drop in um, accuracy on, on APY. And so we can close this gap a little bit with, with ZSLKG, which is our, um, our approach using uh, common sense knowledge graphs and the transformer graph convolution network architecture. And so what we see is that um, we can actually outperform um, the specialized method by a tiny bit. Um, and we can also, uh, on animals with attributes, but we can also close the gap significantly on this, on this harder problem of, of the APY data set. Um, and so there's, you know, we're seeing um, significant improvements over uh, the, um, uh, sorry, significant improvements over um, the prior graph-based methods that are using um, ImageNet as the knowledge source. So one more data set I want to show you in the last couple of minutes is um, this is just a sampling of some of the data sets that we have in um, in the, in the preprint R archive. Second task I wanna show you is, is a natural language processing task called intent classification. And so this is like the Alexa problem. If I, if I make some request in, in natural language, can I categorize it as, as a type of request so that it gets routed maybe to the right module. So now um, we're gonna use uh, a by LSTM um, just as kind of a standard way to encode the input, um, the text for the request and now what we're going to do is compare that, uh, compare ZSLKG to the graph-based methods, um, and also some recent work, um, the state-of-the-art work in the natural language processing community for this problem. It's been a series of, of works um, using capsule networks. So start with the, the state-of-the-art on this problem. Um, uh, and so uh, we see that um, these two papers kind of get around 80%. Um, and when we consider the, the graph-based methods um, that use ImageNet as a knowledge source, we see uh, a pretty large drop-off in quality with, with a huge variance in, in um, the results based on what the, what the target tasks are, what the seen and unseen classes are. And we speculate that that's because um, they, uh, some, are more, some are basically more concrete or more well described in the ImageNet graph, um, and some are more abstract. CSLKG on this um, does, does much better, and we think that that's because we have this, this additional um, source of knowledge and, and kind of rich representation. And so this actually is another task where um, we set a new, uh, the, the, uh, the ZSLKG sets a new state-of-the-art um, accuracy for this, for this particular task. So the last thing I want to show you is just, um, th these are just a subset of the results, again, that are in the archive paper, but just on the data sets that I've shown you so far, um, you know, what's, this, what's the significance of using transformer GCNs? Um, and so uh, that is, um, we, we can see that it is, it can be um, uh, si significant, the, the, the benefit from using this, this nonlinear permutation invariant um, aggregator can be significant. And in particular, that um, LSTMs um, sometimes seem to underperform on some of these tasks, um, whereas as the transformer-based aggregator um, uh, can improve on uh, the most sophisticated linear aggregators like, like attention networks. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, and so, I hope that I've convinced you that this is an interesting area um, uh, for graph experts uh, that, that, that needs more attention. So our work shows that we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. Um, we've shown that richer graphs can boost zero shot learning in a wide range of tasks, uh, extending graph-based methods to new areas like NLP. Um, and we've also shown that more expressive architectures can help uh, when learning to represent these complex graphs. Um, so in particular, transformer GCNs 
our, our new way to do aggregation is both um, nonlinear and permutation invariant. Uh, but there's a lot more to do, and I hope that's where some of you will join us. Uh, certainly, we have a lot more to do on representation learning, like how can we encourage our representations to be more discriminative um, with respect to, to other test classes. Uh, and, and further, we haven't even touched reasoning yet. For, for all the explicit knowledge in, in knowledge graphs, um, it seems likely that adding reasoning to determine additional useful information could, could push this forward and, and make it an even more general approach um, to machine learning. So with that, um, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, particularly uh, uh, my PhD student Nihal, who who does all the work, and and these these great organizations that um, that support the work. Um, so thank you very much. So thanks, Stephen. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. So the first question uh, in the chat box uh, is from Janestra Bianconi. Uh, Janestra, uh, do you want to ask the question? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for, for your talk. So there is a concept in, in, in the study of innovations that has been proposed by Stephen Progress of a uh, adjacent possible, which is a network which evolved by the introduction of new nodes that define a new class in some sense. So I was wondering just uh, maybe <laughs> naively if is it conceivable to have um, an architecture which would have a, a new graph as an output, you know, when you show a new. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a great question. Something that we're thinking about. I don't have a specific answer, but but it, it gets to that that kind of plug at the end for for reasoning that there's that there's so much more that we can potentially do beyond um, mapping a fixed graph representation to embeddings for zero shot learning. Um, so I think that I, I don't know how to do that, but I think that um, if, if people start thinking about that, that'd be a, a great direction to head in. Thank you. So the next question is from Arijit. So do you want to ask the question? Sure. Um, hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, so I was just curious about the attention LSTM that was introduced in the set to set paper. So that, it, that attention LSTM is actually permutation invariant and actually has been used in the graph domain by Gilmer in the message passing paper for quantum chemistry. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, so the, I didn't know about that application in chemistry. Um, so if we're thinking of the same paper, um, I believe we do, do address this in, in the manuscript. And so um, the, the thing about the, the, this, again, if I'm thinking of the, the same paper is that Basically, what they do is they, they average, right, over different permutations? No, so that, that one is like kind of interesting. So the, part, the the way they do it is that, so you have the LSTM, but the input to the LSTM is zero. So it's only you have the bias. And then like the states that get upgrade, updated. So that's why it's permutation invariant. Interesting, okay. Um, that's the an LSTM. That's, that's, so this was a set to set paper by Vinals in 2015 in which they were trying to model sets. Okay. Yeah, well, that, thanks for thanks for the pointer. I'll have to I'll check that out. And maybe we can maybe we can kind of follow up online. Yeah, sure. Because I have used that actually before to to use to encode edges actually. Okay. It worked quite well actually. Yeah, well, we'll have to we'll have to consider that. I mean, I think that for us, the the advantage of of um, uh, the the transformer was was just that it was it was sort of conceptually um, right. straightforward. Right. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Stefan, uh, for the awesome presentation. So we will move on to the next.